Right. How we call it in your best. I got you. In, in simple terms. Steve, um, is this incremental percentages as what I mean is if they had to reach 30, you got to 35, or is it? Oh, no, this is, so 100% of patients coming in were out of control. That's what this is. 100% of patients enrolled were out of control at baseline. What I mean is if they did have this program, how much would they have reached? Good question. So this was not something that they evaluated, frankly. Uh, we did in our CMMI grant, and we saw an absolute risk reduction, or an absolute improvement of 10% across the board for all measures. But for the HRSA program, it was purely quality improvement, so there was no yeah. control group. And Steve, did you measure medication non-adherence in this population? Good question. Uh, not a lot of, uh, of the participants had access to uh, claims data, so it wasn't something that they could easily measure. However, in our collaborative that we're doing now, because it's plan-based, we, we will have that data available. So it was not it was not adherence that was measured. And Dr. Chen, you're saying that like by reducing this and catching these uh, potential events, yes. that could potentially improve or reduce hospitalization? No question, and I can tell you that, I wish I had presented it, but in our CMRMI grant, we did a much more granular deep dive into these drug-related problems, including both adverse drug events and potential adverse drug events. And if you look at the categories that we had, yeah, there were many very serious PADEs that likely would have resulted in an acute event. Yeah. And I can share that later in another meeting, but we, we have that data for our CMRMI program. Another question, do you look at comorbidities in this population? Absolutely, and, and that's the key, because many of the PADEs are based on uh, contraindications or just suboptimal combinations between drugs and other comorbidities, absolutely. So we do try to create an acronym-free zone <laughs> at the Right Care Initiative. <laughs> no, that's true. Yeah. And I would just like to say that th these improvements are consistent with what we've seen in other research, yes. where you see 35% more patients are in good control compared to usual care for that first. So just, true. you know this like the back of your hand, but everyone in the room can't That's be expected to understand PADEs, et cetera. I've never seen it before, so. Thank you. Thanks for reminding me. And Steve, yeah. and relating to the sort of the big picture, doesn't this relate to that eight hundred billion dollar a year number that we heard from UC San Diego's the five twenty eight point four? Yes. Right. So, so the five hundred twenty eight point four billion dollars that are attributable to suboptimal medication therapy is not just side effects. It's not just dosing. It's it's the patients not getting the best results from medication therapy, and that means in many cases. Uh, a better choice of medication, more optimal, is, is, is preferred. Or the, the old treatment inertia, where yes, they got the right medication, but it's dosed to the level where it's never going to make an impact. So it includes all of that. I didn't know the slide would take so much time. I apologize. <laughs> no more acronym, but I, I promise. Um, as I said before, <laughs> you're not the first one to be picked up. Oh, that's true. <laughs> 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 Thank you. 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 Among just under 6,000 patients, we identified 67,000 regulated problems. Uh, that's 11.6 per patient. And you may think that sounds a bit inflated. It was pretty darn accurate. I mean, definitely a big chunk of it had to do with correcting patient behavior with use of medications. But if you look at the different categories that we have, um, the biggest piece was appropriateness and effectiveness of drug therapy. That means, again, patients not getting the right dose of medication, not getting the optimal choice of medications. Um, and in some cases, indications that weren't even being treated. Uh, that was the third. You still had plenty of the safety issues. Those are the side effects and your misses. You still had plenty of medication non-adherence. Um, but again, I'd like to remind everybody that when you add pharmacists in this capacity, they aren't just looking at polypharmacy and adherence, they're looking at optimizing medication therapy more often. Uh, the other piece that we're adding to the program is, uh, <laughs> I hate to admit it, it's slow rolling, but our involvement with the whole person care program for LA County, it's the uh, CMS level 15 waiver. Um, basically, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> there are, is 1.26 billion dollars on the line here. It's a five-year program targeting uh, the most challenging 100,000 Medi-Cal patients in the county. Uh, that's two and a half percent of four million Medi-Cal. Uh, the targeted subgroups are listed uh, going, <coughs> excuse me, in this, uh, this graphic from uh, left to right. It's uh, homelessness, uh, jail transition patients, uh, severe mental illness, high-risk uh, perinatal care. 
<coughs> excuse me, substance use disorder and uh, complex chronic disease. Um, it's a combination of health and social services. Uh, we ended up, uh, we ended up uh, jumping a little bit late. So <coughs> it actually ends um, somewhere around well, at the end of 2020, or early 2021. Uh, we are just now adding the pharmacy piece. Uh, we came in late and sort of sold the, the idea that you know you probably need pharmacy to be involved in this to optimize um, the transition of patients into different er <coughs> pardon me, different areas. And so what happened was we ended up integrating uh, or in the process of integrating 14 pharmacists mm -hmm. to do that uh, for this program. So more to come as we get some results this next 2020 year. I'm glad to come back and share those with you. <coughs> so back to the question. Uh, that I raised earlier, the series of questions that I raised about, you know, can any community pharmacy deliver high quality CMM? Um, we're being very careful, uh, I think in many ways representing the interests and concerns of the plans. Um, I like to think from the stakeholder perspective, if I did this, what would I care about? And what I care about as a plan is I want to spend money wisely. I don't want to do everything food for service. I want to pay for something where there's risk on the line on the part of the provider. Um, and so we'll get to that part in a second. But the first part of getting rid of risk is that uh, making sure we're br uh, bringing in the best pharmacies. And I already explained the process to you, I'll do that again. Uh, the other is, because we have peer partnerships up front, we really, you know, oh, you're so kind, thank you. Uh, thank you. Um, re really excited that, to Hattie's point, you know, these partnerships, they've been brewing for about <laughs> 10 years or so, and, and finally we got to the point where, um, uh, they, there was a, some contact between us and, and an agreement that, you know, this is really beyond our, our capacity. We, we can't get enough pharmacists involved in this work, you know, it's very important. And so both plans, IHP and LA Care, have committed to um, a shared risk model for paying for CMM. And um, I'll mention it later, but the, well here, <laughs> the value-based model we are using is derived from the data from our CMM grant. So the challenge we were given as a school is, can you take your data from the CMI grant and create a value-based payment model that makes sense? And so me, with all my years of experience creating value-based paid models, which is zero, um, dived into the data for about you know, a week, two weeks, and said, hey, I think this makes sense. And it actually went. So, so it's been approved by one plan, it's being adopted by the second. We can talk in well, more detail about what it looks like later. So you have Inland Empire Health Plan, LA Care Health Plan committed. <coughs> yes. And yes. Uh, our Blue Shields, Health Net, United. So, so Scott uh, did a great job of Connecting with folks at Blue Shield, um, I've been speaking to Selena Wong, I'm sure you know very well, uh, and they are very interested. So I've invited them to uh, be part of the leadership committee, um, so they are uh, involved. In, and I actually like it. Honestly, it's, you get to test it out on someone else's dime, right? So if it works, then you can decide how it, which is true, and they, they like that. Um, so uh, Cal Optima it also attended and has been very interested. Uh, oh, yes, Blue Shield. So, it's <laughs> Not exclusively, but it is initially concentrated because these are the partners that come to the table. Uh, as I tell my residents, and uh, I've, I've practiced, by the way, in uh, government health care, um, Beverly Hills Commercial Health Care, and Skid Row. I've seen it all. Um, and I always tell my, my trainees, if you can work with the underserved, you can work with anybody. Right? They are by far the most challenging. Uh, so they're, they're, it isn't restricted to, um, to the, the Medi-Cal population, but initially, because of here's our clinical focus, we, we have been. So, the health plan yeah. has all three lines of business and exchange. I mean, it's pretty big. Yes. We should come on the table. Too. Well, uh, thank you. Another <laughs> offer. I love it. Uh, so, so I've been talking to some people at HealthNet as well. Um, I think there's some interest, but I think there's also some a lot, not really fully understanding what, what we're doing. So I would love to figure out who to talk to them. So thanks, Jim. I think the person is Jean. She's, oh, the, yeah. head of, um, she's the vice president for um, medical uh, uh, affairs. You know, Steve, I'm glad you connected with Deepa. She's heading our pharmacy. Yes. She, she's leading a lot of these kind of things that collaborative practice agreements with Okay, her, yes. I think I'll definitely get her also. Yeah, and I had lunch with her when she first joined. It probably awesome. overwhelmed her at the time because she was just starting out. So we can reconnect and definitely that would be get awesome. her coming. Awesome, thank you. I have, a, yes. I have a question. So um, I noticed that um, one of the main priorities was the high-risk perinatal um, category. So um, as, a, as, a, as a cardiovascular prevention scientist, um, we started a postpartum heart health program, and it's interesting that we can see Medi-Cal patients, as long as they're pregnant, they only get one visit 
like after 30 days, and all their mortality rates are at the highest after they deliver up to 30 days. And uh, I can't get my hands on postpartum Medi-Cal patients, and I'm trying because the program is actually very low cost with a lot of net benefit because we are oh, doing optimal medical therapy of postpartum hypertension yeah, and catching postpartum preeclampsia right, right. and uh, genetic lipid disorders. So uh, I have a model that works. I can't get my hands on the patients and I have a registry in a biorepository so I can collect data as I'm gathering it, but um, I can't get access to the patients. And, and we have a source, so I'm gonna connect you with whole person care. Maybe we can make something happen. That's yeah, because I actually have three sites, oh. Torrance, um, the Cedar sinai Medical Group, and myself. Okay. And you're located where? Um, I'm at the Heart Institute at Cedars. Oh, okay, got it, got it. Okay. So for anybody who wonders why it's worthwhile to take a plane or a train or drive for several hours to get to these meetings, it's because of what just happened. Because babies and mothers are going to be saved as a result of that conversation yeah. that would never happen on a webinar. No kidding. Yeah. No. This is uh, pretty exciting. I think this is going to be the most offers we've had in the limited amount of time. So, <laughs> yeah. so thank you. Like it, Steve. Oh, I appreciate it. Thank you. And the millions of those watching you. That's <laughs> 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 nervous. Okay. Thank you. So uh, truth be told, <laughs> our, our presenters are taped. So some of our conversation will be up on our internet website, and uh, we're really looking forward to uh, Margot's wonderful women's cardiology program in a few minutes, but I thought we should get a taste of what Steve Chen is up to, and also hear just a tiny bit of Steve's family story. Yes, so I'm going to cut it short. That's my hint. <laughs> you know, we'll cover all this other stuff later. <laughs> so he's a regular because he's a co chair of this meeting. So uh, thank you. And you actually, don't have I to just, do it all I in one day. I just realized the clock was moving. Uh, so uh, <laughs> online action career is moving along. I've had great offers. I got what I needed, so thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm not going to fully introduce Manissian. I think what I have to do is kind of tee it up a little bit. Um, Hattie and I had a conversation several months ago, I think now, where uh, we were just talking about different topics, and I just shared with her a story about um, an aunt of mine who had passed away uh, at that time. She was early 70s, um, really a workhorse, I mean, just an amazing woman. And uh, you, know, you would think that, oh gee, that's a pretty full life. And she comes from a family where everyone lived to 100. So it's, it's a little surprising that it happened so early. And the story that I came to learn is that um, she, she gets health care, but she never complains, generally. Uh, well, well, the morning she passed away, she um, didn't feel well, so she went to see her physician. That's a cue right there. She never goes to see her physician unless she has to, right? Uh, and so she was diagnosed as having a cold and sent home. And then later that evening, uh, her husband, she watched TV. Her husband came back half an hour later, and she was she passed from a sudden MI, a very massive MI. Um, so it, it just made me, we, we were talking with Patty about how um, happens too often, doesn't it? Where um, women's uh, symptoms of, of cardiovascular disease are overlooked. What a, what a great example this is. And again, to me and my cue for this one was my aunt, who I know never complained, shows up at the doctor's office, you better take a closer look. She had risk factors, right? She had risk factors, so it's definitely worth evaluating. And it made us think about bringing in uh, an expert to, to talk about it. So we're really excited to, to have you today, and uh, thankful that you're here. I think, uh, oops, I think uh, Dr. Zahari is going to give a more thorough introduction to this. I think I will the projector. Oh, here we go. So Carol Zaher, as a uh, cardiologist who's worked at many of the institutions in the area, including Cedars, uh, has quite a bit of experience with this um, issue of mysterious women's cardiovascular symptoms. Well, thank you, and um, I, I want to just lay a seed in the minds of our participants. As Hattie knows, I, uh, I like to simplify when I can, because life is really complex, and, and sometimes it gets out of hand. Um, and, and these issues, as Steve just mentioned, I mean, the, the, the whole programs that you've talked about and where we want to go, and where it's totally different in different states, and regulatory 
uh, milieu and the, the legal milieu, uh, it just adds to the complexity, so it makes it more challenging to actually get things done that can be fruitful. I, when I, whenever I go to a meeting where I'm trying to be educated or and paying attention, um, I realize I would often walk away thinking, oh, there's so much stuff that happened there, and what can I do, and, and how do I, you know, let the dust settle to, to make a plan. So my, my very simplistic approach that I might ask you to participate in is when you when you walk out of the meeting today, or, or this, this group discussion, is to think of two things. One is, what are the one or two key messages that, that you're going to take away that's meaningful to you, uh, either personally or in your organization or, or whatever you, you want to have that uh, set up against? But what, what, what is a one or two takeaway messages? And then as well, as any good meeting uh, should have, is an action plan. Again, for whatever your message takeaway is, and in relative to your uh, work situation um, or your endeavors, is what can you do? To one or two steps that you might do in your organization or in your own life to actually change uh, the process. I know that sounds maybe too simplistic, but um, I know a lot of folks, including myself, will walk away and go, oh, that was great, and then it ends there. So I'm just putting that seed in. Um, that said, uh, I'm introducing Margo, Dr. Uh, Margo Minissian, who's, again, got an, a, an exclusively very uh, athlete uh, re resume here um, over at one of my original old stomping ground, Cedars, which I, uh, um, my heart is very and um, she's the uh, clinical nurse specialist, nurse practitioner rather, in the Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center uh, over at Cedars Institute. And I think you bring, I've, I've looked at your presentation and I'm really excited to, uh, to hear the details because women's health um, is uh, certainly on the forefront of cardiovascular disease and uh, some things that are just not typical that we learned in our past either medical school environment, pharmacy environment, et cetera. So you have to sort of think maybe in a little uh, different uh, ways of how we attack uh, this problem. So Margo, would you come up and educate us? Thank you so much. Well, it's just such an honor today uh, to be in front of you. And I, uh, my mind, my mind is, is just spinning with different kinds of possibilities um, from listening to this last presentation. And uh, I think that, um, just to give you just a little bit of a preview. So I, I have been a nurse for 20 years and I started off in the heart-lung transplant uh, unit at um, the good old CTICU at UCLA. And uh, I did my, um, my master's training there um, as an acute care nurse practitioner first clinically. And um, one of the very first patients that I actually put a balloon pump in uh, was a 40-year-old woman who had a massive, massive MI that just blew out her left ventricle and I went into the OR and watched the surgeon try and use a substance that looked very similar to Gore-Tex to try and hold it together uh, while she was on the transplant list and she had these four beautiful sisters that would come and visit her and um, I watched her LVAD clot and I watched her die. and. Um, when I graduated um, from uh, that program, I got good advisement to go on at least four interviews. Don't just take the first job that you get offered. So I did, and the fourth job interview I went on was to help start a woman's heart program. Outpatient, uh, oral meds that people had to swallow, and I didn't know any of them. I only knew IV drugs at the time. Uh, but I just love the idea of scaling back and getting ahead of the problem. And so over my 15 years of starting this Barbara Streisand Women's Heart Center with Dr. Barry Merce, uh, I am now doing research in young women who have adverse pregnancy outcomes. And they have a four to eight fold risk of dying of heart disease by the time they are 60. Does that include stroke? Uh, yes, it does cardiovascular and they uh, are essentially giving you tattletale signs in their 20s and 30s and sometimes 40s 
And I was in the OR uh, once again uh, this last week because one of my, I have about 100 women in my registry now, and uh, one of the early ones, she almost died from preterm preeclampsia, and uh, she has so much PTSD just even coming into the hospital, and she had pretty rampant um, uh, what the OBs would call chronic hypertension, but she wasn't hypertensive before her first baby, um, but her hypertension never resolved. Um, and with a lot of close monitoring, uh, we got her to 38 weeks with her second pregnancy, and she had a beautiful baby girl on Thursday, and I managed more rapid hypertension, but we did not go to the ER. We held on to her uh, for an extra 12 hours, made sure her meds were adjusted, that her enzymes were fine, and she had 124 over 74 blood pressure yesterday on three meds, but she's doing great and having a wonderful experience. So this is why, this is why we are here today, and this is why I, I wish I almost would have shown you a different presentation, but we're gonna be going over some guidelines, but we have some very exciting data um, that actually spins off of uh, work that Dr. Ron Victor did um, that you were a key stakeholder um, with uh, having pharmacists out in the community. Uh, I utilized local ethnic minor, uh, minority nurses uh, in uh, housing projects and mega churches, and we did ASCVD risk scoring and risk stratified these people and got them back um, or connected with physicians. So I will hopefully be randomizing and uh, intervening on them um, with one of my next NIH grants. So. Without further ado, uh, these are my disclosures, and I'm happy to share my slides. Uh, so it's really staggering that half of women uh, don't know that heart disease is their number one killer still today. Just huge education disparities. And this is where a care team really comes into play. They pick up their prescription, they can get a piece of information there. They go in and they're sitting in the waiting room waiting for their physician, they can get information there. But the fact of the matter that women still don't understand this and this um, over um, uh, stimulated, uh, too much information for us to look at, the fact that they don't understand this is really staggering. And that they really, you know, we are so successful with breast cancer and we really should use breast cancer awareness and treatment and early identification as a role model for what cardiovascular disease prevention should really look like. And so we're about 40 years behind, uh, and we're, we're rapidly trying to catch up. Uh, and unfortunately, you speak of stroke. Um, stroke is the number four cause of death um, for women in the United States, and more women are likely to die um, from heart disease and stroke overall than men. Uh, and it's... Um, quite staggering, and unfortunately, when we look at um, coronary heart disease rates, it's really our African-American women that are at the highest risk, and um, they are also for stroke as well. Uh, and so, why is that? You know, part of it, like I said, is education. Uh, much of the education really needs to be tailored to the needs of the individual that you are engaged with. And if you take a look at many of the cardiovascular risk factors and symptoms that women have, it's not just cut and dry. Now, we're in Los Angeles. When you think of a heart attack, we think of a Hollywood heart attack, right? What's a Hollywood heart attack? A Hollywood heart attack is that middle-aged, beer belly, overweight guy on the golf course, and he's kind of sweaty, and he's shaped like an apple, and he's swinging his golf, court, his, uh, his golf club, and his shoulder is aching, and it's radiating down his arm, and he's getting, you know, substernal crushing chest pain. Well, that happens sometimes for women, sometimes. Most of the time, you know what their number one symptom is? And you'll see this in my presentation twice because I want you to remember this. Excessive fatigue. Now, ladies. always. <laughs> <laughs> Which one of you is not identifying with excessive fatigue today? My husband was talking in his sleep. He was snoring. He was doing all kinds of things. I slept three hours last night between my children and the dogs. And anyway, it's just 
we're running and we're really in the sandwiched type of society where we're taking care of little ones, uh, maintaining careers, taking care of older aging family members and, and the like. So very important to start to think about other types of symptoms. We train our patients to say the word chest pain, even if excessive fatigue, shortness of breath uh, are their main symptoms which are their, what we would call an anginal or a chest pain equivalent. We also have different types of risk factors because we're women. Wait, so, wait, wait. Yeah. You said you train your patients to say chest pain even if they're not experiencing it so that they'll get the attention? Correct, in the emergency room or with their primary care doctor. Urgent care. We train our ER. Most of the time, our patients aren't anywhere near our ER. So we're, we're training them with the Hollywood heart attack keywords that more people can identify with, trigger words, so that they're taken seriously. If they go in with excessive fatigue or shortness of breath, half of them will leave the ER without an EKG and with an Ativan prescription for panic attack. So that's where a lot of the problem lies. When we start to think about risk factors, uh, we think about specific risk factors, as I just mentioned, preeclampsia, preterm delivery. These are finally now in our national guidelines for the American Heart and American College of Cardiology. Uh, and so, you know, postmenopausal women, uh, their lipid profiles start to change. Their good cholesterol, their HDL goes down, their triglycerides start to creep up. Uh, and then, you know, we're going to go into how we're supposed to screen for that. And then there's a milieu of other things that men and women have in common. But the fact of the matter is, women's symptoms are atypical. And so therefore, acute coronary syndromes, myocardial infarction, heart attacks, chest pain are way underdiagnosed. And so this creates a very dangerous situation. Why? Because they're not on optimal medical therapy for their risk factors. When we take a look, and this is a brand new paper that just um, is actually coming out ahead of press, uh, that uh, women um, are less likely to be on a cholesterol-lowering medication that we know reduces heart attack, strokes, and death in everyone that we've had for over 30 years that is essentially free uh, by most payers or you can buy for $5 at Costco. When we go on and we think, oh gosh, well maybe it's just because they, they can't tolerate it, those, those cranky women, they don't want to take it, they're busy, they, you know, we're, we're in LA, everybody wants to do stuff natural, they don't want a prescription. Uh, I have a really good um, uh, elevator talk for that if you ever need to try and convince a family member that they need their, their statin. It's um, plant-based, vegan, <laughs> a derivative of tree bark. <laughs> and it is essentially an FDA approved, safe, 30 years of data, did I mention that? <laughs> Preventive vitamin. And if any of you payers can help me coin a way of being able to describe these medications as prevention vitamins, people will pay a fortune and take loads of vitamins. And unfortunately, most of them just have very expensive urine. And I'm gonna show you a few more slides as to why I say that. Lipids are not the only problem. When we think about hypertension, good old fashioned coronary artery disease or heart failure, women have less optimal medical therapy offered to them there as well. So I'd like to just present with you just some different updates that I find interesting in prevention. Um, I'm going to focus a little bit more on cholesterol today because our guidelines literally just changed um, in March at the American College of Cardiology. And before I go into that, you know, there's been a huge uproar. I really love this um, diagram. Uh, also just came out um, just very recently. And uh, it's the ABCs of prevention. And so uh, I have a, a, a one minute story on aspirin. So how many of you have heard that the new aspirin guidelines have changed? We just argued about that for about 20 minutes at Stanford on Tuesday with a bunch of cardiologists. It's AP little a. 
one factor of it. Oh, okay. and, and aspirin is used in many different things. We now have great data that aspirin wards off preeclampsia and high-risk pregnancies. So the OBGYNs are like, hey, let's put aspirin in the water if you're pregnant. And then we're scaling. <laughs> then we have all these arguments. Well, I have this one patient that is a, a cardiac rehab patient. is really resistant hypertension. And even though I'm in a women's heart center, I 